Chapter 3, Measures of Central Tendency, Part 1. Learning objectives for Chapter 3. When we're done with this chapter, we will understand the purpose of measuring central tendency. We'll define and compute the three measures of central tendency. Briefly, they are the mean, the median, and the mode. We'll be able to describe how the mean is affected when a set of scores is modified. Describe the circumstances in which each of the three measures of central tendency is appropriate to use. I'll explain how the three measures of central tendency are related to each other in, in symmetrical and skewed distributions. From the previous chapter, we learned symmetrical looks like this visually. We have positively skewed distributions and negatively skewed distributions. And finally, um, we'll learn to draw and interpret graphs displaying several means or medians representing different treatment conditions or groups. So, um, as we did with Chapter 2, it's important to review the tools necessary so that you can acquire the new skills of this chapter. And we begin with um, a summation notation. So we've learned that sigma means to sum anything that proceeds it. So if we saw a sum of x, that would um, indicate to us that we need to take the sum of all of our x values and frequency distributions. So we learned about frequency tables that look like this, where we would have our x values all listed, all our variables listed from high to low, and then how often each of those values occurred. Or we can be presented a graph where the ordinate displays the frequency and the abscissa displays our x values. So again, um, every chapter builds on the previous skills. So uh, uh, again, it's always important to make sure that you are mastering material before you move on to the next chapter. So, um, again, the, the title of this chapter is Measures of Central Tendency, so defining central tendency. Central, you know, when we think about what that means to us, we would think of things, synonyms like the middle of something. Um, and tendency tends to refer to, by definition, an inclination toward a particular characteristic. So, what we're looking at is um, a statistic as a measure and what we're engaging in is determining a single score to define the center of a distribution. So we're talking about a distribution of scores. And um, it should be noted that when we refer to scores, we're talking about one, maybe two um, scales of measurement. We're not talking um, necessarily about, um, well, I take this back. What we can apply all four scales of measurement and scores can be our x values and it can be nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Um, and depending on what type of scale of measurement we're using will determine if we're going to be using the mean, median, and mode. So again, the score is simply, you know, the variable x. It could be y, but for most of our um, examples we'll be using x as the placeholder for a variable. And as I indicated in a previous video, if you understand the purpose of a particular statistic, then you will master um, the, its, you know, its function. You will understand how to apply it. So the purpose of identifying a measure of central tendency is to find a single score. Okay, so again, a single score that is most typical or best represents the entire group. In chapter two. Under the umbrella of descriptive statistics, we learned to organize data, whether it was in a table, again a frequency table, or whether it was in a graph. We learned to organize data so that we can tell a story about the information um, that we've collected and it's easier for the consumers of our research to, uh, to digest um, instead of presenting raw data. Now we're moving from organizing information to summarizing it. So again, descriptive statistic entails organizing and summarizing. So frequency distributions and the use of graphs are all um, part of organizing. Summarizing, we do that by using 
measures of central tendency, and then what we'll learn in chapter four, which is measures of variability. So we're using one, one value to represent all the scores. So instead of giving someone the data represented in a table or a graph, we would say the mean age of this class is 21. Instead of showing the frequency of all the different ages that are um, demonstrated in a particular group or sample or population, most of us just want information to be summarized for us. So again, think of it, the analogy may be like um, our elected officials, right? We elect officials to vote on our behalf on certain issues. Um, and we recognize that those representatives don't always do a great job of representing everyone, right? Um, they may go with the tendency of the most or the tendency of the, the ones that speak the loudest, whatever it may be. But this is similar in the sense that we don't have everyone represented equally. It's just one data point that represents all. And hopefully it's a good representation of what all the other values look like. So here's an example of um, central tendency measures. So we can consider these three graphs, and this is coming from our reading of chapter three. So we have um, this distribution, the first one here, that's very symmetrical. And if we think of the center, right, the middle of the distribution, because it's symmetrical, we would most likely identify x is equal to five as the middle or the center of this particular distribution. In the second distribution, we see that the distribution is not symmetrical. And in fact, it has this skewed shape and the tail is pointing to the negative. So we know that it's negatively skewed. And if we look for the center, now this idea of the middle becomes a little more complex and um, requires more definition. Um, and again, based on the three measures of central tendency, we'll learn you know, based on the fact that this distribution is skewed, which measure of central tendency would be most appropriate as a precursor to something I'll discuss more in depth. If a distribution is skewed, the median um, score is going to be the most appropriate measure of central tendency. But where is the middle? Well, we can think about equal um, number of boxes, right, above and below particular value to find the middle. And if we were to do that, we would probably end up somewhere around x is equal to 7 <clears throat> or thereabouts. So again, depending on what we mean by the center is going to change the value that we um, record or report as the middle. And then the last one, we see that this distribution is symmetrical, um, but it's separated almost into two separate distributions. And so we might have the tendency to say that the middle is equal to 2, right, this x value of 2, and x equal to 8, because those are the centers of those two distributions. But this data set may be from one collection of um, data points, and so that may, may not be the most appropriate. The middle, again, in this case, may be 5, because that's in the center. But we recognize that 5 isn't even one of the x values in that distribution. So we would question, is that the best representative score of all the other scores? So these are things that we need to think about um, to determine what the best measure of central tendency is. Again, to determine which value, which x value of all the x values that we're working with, is, it best, is the best summation or representative of all the other values. So again here, just to read what I have here, figure 3.1 shows that no single concept of central is always the best. Again, as I indicated, all three, we come up with different centers. Different distribution shapes require different conceptualization of center. If it's symmetrical, if it's skewed, if it's bimodal, we'll learn about what that means. All of these things need to be taken into consideration. And then finally, choose the one which best represents the score in a spe specific situation. So we'll learn um, different elements of a distribution that will help us identify the best measure of central tendency. So I've presented these equations before. 
So um, in terms of notation, this little guy is referred to as mu, and it represents the mean of a population. It's a parameter, meaning that we have access to all individuals, all x values, and we know what the population size is, and we're able to compute the average of a population. For sample, we use the notation capital M to represent the average of a sample, and again, the process entails taking the sum of all x values dividing by how many values we have. And we're going to um, use simple algebra to solve for variables that aren't given. Um, for instance, if I were to ask um, you to solve for the sum of x, right, given this original equation, so again mu, let's just rewrite it over here, mu is equal to the sum of x over n, and I gave you what mu was equal to, so I said mu is equal to 100, and n is equal to, let's say, 5, And I asked you to determine what um, the sum of x is equal to. Okay, so we'll, we'll be doing a lot of simple algebra to um, identify missing variables. So a very simple question, maybe calculate the mean of something, and you're given a lot of x values and you know what n is equal to. But in this case, we're giving you what mu is equal to and what the population size is, and, and the question is, what is the sum of x equal to? So given our understanding of, of basic algebra, we would, we would consider the original equation, and if we want to isolate the sum of x, we simply would take um, the population size and multiply it on both sides, meaning that the sum of x would equal mu multiplied by the population size. So if we replace the values in this particular example with um, the, the original equation, so mu, and I'll write it over here, mu is equal to the sum of x over n, and I said the mu is equal to 100. Sum of x is what I want to solve for, n is equal to 5. And again, if I just use simple algebra, I would determine that the sum of x is equal to 500. And we can put that back into um, the equation to check our work. Is 500 divided by 5 100? The answer is yes. So I'm just showing you this now because we will, um, some of the questions will require that you manipulate the variables to solve for a missing value. So it won't always be a simple process of calculate the mean. Um, you may be given the mean and you're asked to calculate what the sample size is or the population size. So here's just a brief example of how you would go about doing that. All right, so the mean can be thought of in three different ways. So we refer to as three definitions. So one is what we just went over, this, the sum of all scores. So mu, again, is, let's just write that a little bit nicer. Mu is equal to the sum of x, so the mathematical center. Um, so we would calculate it using that equation. Or we can think of it as the amount each individual receives when the total is divided equally among all individuals in a distribution. For example, if I were to say I have a class size of 60 students, excuse me, 30 students. I have 30 students in a class. I bake some cookies and I have, let's say, 60 cookies total. Those would be my x values, so I'd actually the sum of x, oops, and so if I want to determine how many cookies is each individual going to receive, I, again, I know I have 60 cookies, I have 30 individuals um, to evenly distribute my cookies. So I have 60, 
30 students, and so each student is going to receive two cookies each. So again, we, we look back at this original equation, and now we're saying that another way of thinking of the average is equal distribution among individuals in a distribution. So again, cookies, I have, uh, it represents the x values. I have 60 of them. So if I summed up all my cookies, I have 60 cookies. I have a population of 30, n is equal to 30. And again, if I take all those cookies and divide by how many students I have, each one is going to receive two. So that's equal distribution, but it's also the same as saying the average um, of that distribution. And then finally, the balance point, um, which I'll visually display to you in the next couple of slides. So we think of the mean as the balance point, meaning that we have equal distance not the equal number of scores, but the equal distance from the center of the distribution or the mean, the mathematical mean. And so what do I mean by that? Let's look at this teeter-totter. Um, and first let's consider the x values. So we have our x and our frequency. So starting with the highest score of 10, and that occurred once and a score of six, and that occurred twice, and a score of two, that occurred once, and a score of one, and that occurred once. So if I want to calculate the average, the mathematical average, again, it's mu is equal to the sum of x over n. So we can come up with these values. We learned in the last chapter that n is the same as saying the, um, the summation of our f the summation of our frequency. So we have 2, 3, 4, 5. And if we just count the boxes, let's make sure and confirm that that's correct. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So our frequency of 5. So n is equal to 5. So we, re we can replace that here. And now we need to know the other variable is the sum of x. And again, I caution you from just coming over here and adding your x values. And the reason I caution you is because we have one value that occurred more than once. And so we can do f of x here. We have 10 times 1, 10. 6 times 2, it's 12. 2 times 1, 2. 1 times 1 is 1. And now we recognize that the sum of x is the same if we're working with the frequency distribution table is the same as the sum of fx. So now we can calculate the sum of x by taking the sum of this column at the very end here. So we have 10 plus 12, 22, plus 2 more, 24 plus 1, we have 25. Okay, so now we know what the sum of x is, 25. 25 divided by 5 is equal to 5. And visually, again, that's already been determined. That's this center here. And again, now we're talking about the balance point. The teeter-totter is balanced because we have equal distance from the center um, and the values. But ask yourself, again, if this is the center, that's the center or middle of the distribution, do we have equal number of scores or frequencies? The answer is no. Above that value of 5, we have um, 1, 2, 3, 3 frequencies. Let me just rewrite that. 3 frequencies. Or 3 scores. And below, how many do we have? We have 2 scores. So again, by definition, the balance point doesn't refer to the number of scores, equal number of scores. That's the defi definition of the mean that we'll talk more about in just a moment or in the next video. But um, the balance point in terms of the mean is equal distance. So I'm going to erase a, lo a lot of this so that I can illustrate better what I mean by that. So, Okay, so again, we have the center. We've determined it mathematically as the average score is 5. That's right in the middle. And then we're going to determine how far away are these scores from that center. So we have a, a score of 6 above 5, right? 
and that is one one point above and it occurs twice so we have to account for it twice so then we have um, two points above and then now we're going to take it all the way to number 10 so one two three four and five so total points a distance away from that center score five five plus one plus one more seven points above the mean again distance from the mean and now on the other end we consider the score of two and that's one two three three points below the mean and then a score of one would be one two three four okay in total now we're, we we would determine that there's seven points in terms of distance from the mean below the mean okay so again by definition the balance point could be is understood as the distance in points from the center of the distribution and the center is determined by the mathematical mean which we calculated here here's another example to make sure we understand um, what we mean by the balance point so again let's consider our x values and their frequencies to, to calculate the mathematical center the mu of the distribution so we have a score of 11 occurred once a score of 9 occurred once a score of 6 occurred twice and a score of 3 that occurred once alright so if I want to calculate the mean it's the calculation is the sum of x over n and we know that n is equal to the sum of f so how many scores am I working with so again if I look at this f column 2 3 4 5 and again we can confirm this visually there's 1 2 3 4 5 scores or 5 frequencies so n is equal to 5 and now I need to calculate the sum of x a frequency distribution table so I know that it's fx and again it's only one value that has um, more than one occurrence but nonetheless let's continue with the development of the skill so fx 11 9 um, times 1 is 9 6 times 2 is 12 and 3 times 1 is 3 so if we calculate or take the sum and um, let me correct this here should be the sum of fx and if we take the sum in that column we get 35 so now we know the sum of x is equal to 35 35 divided by 5 is equal to 7 and that's where this is coming from where the mu is located at the x value equal to 7 and now again based on our understanding of equal distance from the mean we'll do the same process as I did on the previous example or previous teeter-totter okay so a score of 9 it is 1 2 points above and the score of 11 1 2 3 4 so 4 so total we have 6 points in distance above the mean and down below we have a score of six occurring once so that's one occurring a second time so that's another one and then all the way to number three so we have one two three four so total we have six points below the mean and it's equal distance so again take into consideration this idea of how many scores do I have above the mean I have two and I have three below so it's not equal number of scores above the center or below the center it's the distance from the mean okay the mean can also be applied to the combination of more than one distribution so we may combine two sets of scores um, to determine the what we refer to as the overall or weighted mean. So I may um, be interested in the 
average of all three um, sections of my statistics courses, the average age or the average GPA. So instead of taking them um, individually, I want to combine all three distributions to find the weighted or combined mean. So it, it, this requires um, three steps. First, we determine the combined sum of all scores. Determine the combined number of scores and divide by the sum of scores by the total number of scores. So the equation is the overall mean is equal to the sum of x1. That subnotation of 1 and 2 just simply refers to distribution 1, distribution 2. So for the example that I gave, um, section 501, 502, 503. So the subnotation is just a label. No math required, so it's just a labeling um, of which distribution we're, we're um, obtaining these values from. And we take the sum of the sum of x's, the sum of scores for all our distributions, and divide it by the summation of our sample sizes. And that will give us the overall weighted mean. So I'm going to walk you through a quick example of that. All right, so this example is actually coming from the learning check um, in chapter 3, and it's page 65 if you have the hard um, copy of the textbook. And so it says one sample has a sample size of six, five scores with a mean of four. A second sample has a, a sample size of three, three scores with a mean of 10. If, and excuse me for this little typo here, not the toe, <laughs> if the two samples are combined, what is the mean of the combined sample? So again, the weighted mean, overall mean, is equal to, and we can still use the notation of m, is the sum of x1 plus the sum of x2 over n1 plus n2. And as I always recommend, you start with the equation and replace the variables that are already given or known. And we know what n1 is equal to. That's equal to 5. That was a given. And n2 was equal to 3. And that was also a given. And now we need to determine the sum of x. When we look back at the information, sum of x is not given. But two other variables are given. So again, let's re review our equation for, for the mean is the sum of x over n. So in the first sample, sample 1, all right, we know that the mean is equal to 4. So let's replace variables. The sum of x is what we're trying to find out. And the sample size is equal to 5. Therefore, n would equal... So if we want to, excuse me, not n, we know what n is. We want to find out what the sum of x is. Sum of x is equal to, we would just multiply here on both sides. The sum of x would equal 20. For sample 2, and again we can enter that into our distribution. So that would equal 20. And for our second distribution, we were told that the mean is equal to 10. Sum of x is what we want to find out. And again, this would be sub 1, this would be sub 2. And our sample size for our second distribution was equal to 3. Therefore, the sum of x, 2, would equal right, um, 3 times 10 is equal to 30. And again, you should make sure that it makes sense if you replace the variables given this response. Is this true? Is 10 equal to 30 over 3? And the answer is yes. So again, we confirm that our answer is correct. So the sum of x sub 2 is equal to 30. And now we can solve for the weighted mean. So 20 plus 30 is equal to 50. 5 plus 3 is equal to 8. And we'll carry it over here. So 50 divided by 8 in your calculators. Again, 50 divided by 8, we should get 6.25. 
So given that these two individual distributions with their own means, the first distribution was mean equal to 4, the second distribution mean equal to 10, when we combine the two distributions, we get an overall mean equal to 6.25. And something to consider and point out that it's weighted um, by the number of scores. So whichever distribution has a larger number of scores, the weighted mean will be closer to the mean of that distribution. What I mean by that, again, the first sample had a mean of 4. So sample 1 had a mean of 4, and it contributed 5 scores. The second distribution had a mean of 10. The mean is larger, but it only contributed three scores. So weighted meaning that the overall mean is going to be pulled closer to the distribution that contributed more scores. And so five is larger than three, so the mean, the overall mean of 6.25 is closer to four than it is to 10 because that distribution contributed more scores. Okay, so this um, slide we... Um, are given a distribution, so we'll be computing the mean for a frequency distribution table. So this, the x values, are um, defined as scores on, on a quiz, and f, again, how often those scores occurred. It's a pretty normal distribution where the highest score is in the center here of a score of 8, and then using this column of fx, as I illustrated in the previous example, we can figure out what the mean is. So again, our equation is the mean is equal to the sum of x over n. The calculations have already been completed for us, um, but again, we know that n is equal to the sum of f. So if we take the sum of this column here, we get 8, and then we know that the sum of x is the same as the sum of fx when we're talking about a frequency distribution. So we took our x values, multiplied it by their corresponding frequency to get the value of fx. And now we can take the summation of this column, and in this case we get 66. And all we've done is taken the values that we've calculated, so the mean is equal to 66 over the number of scores we're working with, which in this case is equal to 8. And if you enter that into a calculator, we get the same answer as we see below here of 8.25. So that's the average score of this distribution. Again, the purpose of a measure of central tendency is to summarize a distribution using one value. So what we're saying is that this x value, x equal to 8.25, is the best representative of this distribution of quiz scores, but notice something important. Notice that the value of 8.25 isn't even one of our x values, but that's okay because again we're, we're calculating the mathematical um, center of the distribution using our equation, um, but it is an important um, fact to note that that's not even one of our x values, but what we're saying is of these eight scores, a score of 8.25 is the center and best representative value of these different quiz scores, um, of these eight quiz scores. All right, to ensure that we have um, been able to digest all of this information and can apply the concepts and terms and equations that have been presented thus far, here's a quick learning check. A sample of 12 scores has a mean of 8. What is the value of the sum of x of the sample? So again, I've, I've done an example of this um, before. So the mean, always oh, start with your equation. So essential. Start with the equation and replace variables that are known. So the mean, we're saying, is equal to 8. The sum of x is what we're interested in solving for. The sample size is equal to 12. So in order to calculate the sum of x, we simply multiply on both sides, and in our calculators, 12 multiplied by 8 gives us 96. So the sum of x in this example would equal 96.
And that concludes part one of chapter three. Again, um, focusing on the learning objectives, the introduction of the first measure of central tendency, the mean. We'll talk a little bit more about it in, in the subsequent parts two and three. Um, but for now, review the equation for calculating mu and sample size, as well as calculating the overall mean of multiple distributions.